podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people? That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I'm John Rojas, filling in for Chris this week because he is at the beach on a much-deserved vacation with the family. Thanks for tuning in and spending the time with us. Hope you're sharing the podcast with a friend or two. So if you haven't yet, shoot them a text or an email with your favorite episode or two. All right, this week's guest is Catherine Judge. Catherine wrote the book, Direct, The Rise of the Middleman Economy and the Power of Going to the Source. And in this episode, Chris talks with Catherine about what middlemen are and how they've potentially taken control of our economy. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump right into the interview. So enjoy. I became aware of the issues with middlemen and their impact uh, when we talked to a former guest about the impact middlemen have on our food supply and our food source. And what really struck me when I saw your book and, and started looking into it is, you know, not a lot of people know about this rather new economy, right? The middleman economy. So I want to start with this. What interested you in tackling such a niche topic, such as middlemen? So really, it was this bringing together of a bunch of work I had done as an academic with my personal life. So a lot of my, so I'm a law professor, I teach up at Columbia. A lot of my work has been, let's understand what went wrong in 2007 and 2008. We had a financial crisis that brought down the rest of the economy, created high unemployment, and really stagnated growth for a long period of time. And part of what I realized is we went from having a bank-based system, a relationship-based system in finance, to having these efforts to eke out little efficiencies in the flow of capital through these very long and complex kind of capital supply chains. We had securitization, securitization leading to asset-backed commercial paper, leading to money market mutual funds. So we had these longer, more complex uh, chains that grew over time that appeared to create efficiencies and savings and opportunity in the short run, but then created a lot of fragility and a lot of opacity in ways that aggravated in, uh, significantly uh, the size of the dysfunction that we saw in 07 and 08. And then there I was, you know, as a mom of two kids, and, you know, I was, like, feeding them Cheerios. I was, like, trying to just figure out, like, where the Cheerios actually came from. They had a really nice picture of a little farmer on the back, speaking of, you know, farm and food. Um, so I just wrote Cheerios. They will not tell you, right? Like, they have these really great pictures, but, like, they will not actually tell you where those oats are grown. Um, and I realized how often that that is true, and I started getting into kind of food supply chains, and I realized that there's this incredible different set of ecosystems out there. One is we have had this growth in, like, farm stands and CSA, where you really go, you know the farmer, you know where the food is, but that's the exception. The norm are these incredibly long, disaggregated chains. I was talking to my cousin in Illinois who actually grows corn and soy and realizing like most of what she grows like feeds animals in China. And so suddenly I was realizing the, the growth of length and complexity in ways that potentially introduce fragility and that undermine our ability to get basic information about impact uh, really pervades just so many different areas of our economy in ways that we oftentimes don't see and don't pay attention to. It's such a nuanced topic. In just what you mentioned, I want to talk about the financial collapse. Are we seeing similar impacts today? The fragility, for example, you take the, the war in Ukraine, all of a sudden Russia provides most of the world's fertilizer. They're our sole, you know, or one of our primary ones. Now we're having an issue with that, F food shortages. I mean, the globalization that we're experiencing combined with the capitalistic need to always optimize for profit, I feel like sets us up for an environment where 
we have no ability to deal with uh, change, to deal with the unexpected. Would you say that that's what we've gotten ourselves into? I do think that's a big part of it. And part of what the book tries to dive into is that we spend a lot of time talking about globalization. We spend a lot of time talking about scale and these really large uh, corporations. And part of what the book explores is the way intermediation, which is this complex topic nobody wants to pay attention to, is actually key to understanding what we mean by globalization, how we got a globalized system, what are the various risks that come up around it, what are the opportunities for exploitation that arise from it. So we actually need to understand kind of the chains through which production has become this multi-continent, multi-nodal uh, undertaking. Um, and then, you know, similarly, like scale, like this is what allows kind of this further disaggregation. So it is, it's about kind of the corporate uh, demands, it's the demands for profitability, but also it's like saying even corporations who care about profitability got the risks wrong because they were focusing, relatively speaking, on kind of short term, this looks like it's more efficient, it looks like it's going to save us money, it looks like it's easier, without fully appreciating the risks that they were taking on, right? So we saw a lot of foregone profitability of companies recently because they didn't understand their supply chain risks. So much of this reminds me of an argument I've long made for really strict capitalism, which is, especially when you're dealing with public companies, they're always only concerned about the next quarter, right? CEOs are incentivized based on quarterly earnings, perhaps at the longest stretch, one year, two years. And that constantly is a sacrifice for long-term planning and really better decision-making. Do you think that a lot of the suffering we're seeing due to you know, middlemen and the fragility you're talking about is also or is really a direct cause from short term thinking. Again, I think short termism is is a significant challenge. It has certainly aggravated all the problems we've seen. But part of what we're seeing right now is the way to understand the mechanism, the ways that that short termism leads to future fragility is we actually need to understand, well, what are the natures of the trade offs that they are making? And that's what's going to help us understand if we want to build a more sustainable economic system, a more responsible economic system, like how can we make those trade-offs differently? So it's certainly about short-termism, but it's about understanding the ramifications of short-termism where we've allowed this kind of complex array of chains to create this interconnected system where geopolitical risks, you know, as you mentioned, uh, or other decisions that are happening in one place can have these outsized effects because everybody's acting on partial information. They have faith that everything's going to work. As soon as they lose that faith, they're just looking out for themselves. And that magnifies the degree of dysfunction that we get from kind of a shock to the system. So I certainly agree it's about short-termism, but it's about like, okay, we've talked a lot about that. Now let's actually look at the structures through which that short-term focus translates into systems that are inherently more fragile, that are prone to break down at the worst possible times, and where there's information that is systematically lost uh, in ways that, that undermine accountability. When you talk about middlemen and the middleman economy, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So, and it's an important distinction between middlemen and the middleman economy. So okay. middlemen are the connectors. They are the the actors that help us overcome all of the informational challenges, the logistical challenges that can impede the flow of goods or the flow of money from those who have them, from those who need them. And so they're absolutely critical to our modern economy. The middleman economy is the particular structure that has built up in recent decades, where we've seen a simultaneously growth of increasingly large and increasingly powerful middlemen, and how they're both fed and fed by these increasingly long and complex supply chains. So the book explores how in food and finance and retail and so many other areas, we've had this growing scale of these incredibly large global intermediaries. I mean, Amazon and Walmart are the two, they produce the most revenue. They're the two biggest uh, employers. They, they've created kind of two of the most wealthiest families on the planet. Uh, but then their scale also is part of what allows the changing nature of production where you are kind of like doling all the different steps out to the thing that seems cheapest. And so it's how these two different processes kind of fed through each other 
and has really transformed the fundamental structure of the economy in ways that have impacts for us individually, but that we just don't see. And why don't we see them? And so really, it's because we're seeing the end player, right? So like right now, if you go to Walmart, you see Walmart, you see the package good, you're not seeing the people and the places that played a role in the production of that good, how they were affected by that, what it, what, what impact it had, all of the different kind of ships and trains or trucks that the good went on and different inputs went on. So all you're seeing is the finished product. And so generally speaking, even Amazon, you know, it has a platform to connect you with third party sellers, but it's really designed just to let you see the finished product and not to let you engage in a meaningful way where you're actually understanding kind of not just that there's this good, uh, but there's a, a process behind it. That can also really matter. So, you know, the one thing that I think a lot of people might say if they're if they don't want to dig into this is, yeah, I hear you. But like I can now order water balloons off of Amazon and for ninety nine cents plus my prime membership, which I'm going to pay for anyways, they'll show up at my door or, you know, if I go to the grocery store, this is an area that that's crazy for me. You know, I can get a package of strawberries for like two bucks. And I, I don't know where they came from, but the government's not going to send me stuff that's going to kill me. So, like, why do I care? If I go to the farmer's market, it's five bucks. So, yeah, it's local, but, uh, I, you know, we're talking efficiencies here. We have brought the cost of things down, the convenience of things up. I really don't understand why that's an issue. Yeah, so a lot of it is drawing out how this happened and recognizing there's incredible benefits. I do hear you. I mean, the truth is, like, I'm busy, too. All of us take advantage of the the low prices and the incredible speed and reliability that something like Amazon offers, right? I mean, at this point, American households, uh, the average American household is a Prime member. Um, and we also know that once you become a Prime member, you shop at Amazon even more because it feels free uh, each time you're ordering one more thing. And so it's not actually trying to get rid of this. It's helping people to understand and see what they're not seeing about this. And in particular, helping people to understand and see where there might be a gap between what their best interests are and what the incentives are of those intermediaries. So going back to Amazon, you know, some of the recent corporate polls suggest 30% of people feel guilty after shopping at Amazon. 40% might like to shop there less, uh, but they keep shopping there because they actually don't feel like they have another readily available option. We look at sellers and like the cut like whenever you're buying something on Amazon, you know, some from a third party seller, uh, some of that's going to Amazon, some of that's going to third party seller. The amount that's going to Amazon has significantly increased every single year for the last seven years. So it's like once you have an intermediary that does provide this incredibly valuable service, they build this incredible fulfillment system and this platform, this infrastructure that suddenly we all come to rely on. Well, they can, in subsequent periods of time, in a dynamic system, they use their control over that infrastructure and their relationships to at times really further their interest at the expense of others. So it's not saying we could squash them out, but that we do need to think about how to make sure we continue to get innovation and we continue to have meaningful optionality. And so we can see it in a, a number of different areas where once you have a certain amount of power and control, uh, both, and then we make that concrete in terms of what's the expertise you have, what's the information you have, what's the relationship you have, what's the infrastructure that you control. Like, let's see how in like a real estate, how in retail, in all of these different areas that then gets used to actually entrench systems that aren't optimal or to make sure that kind of like a disproportionate share of the gains from potential future innovations isn't going to consumers, it's not going to creators, but a meaningful shift of power to the middleman. So it's not saying this is bad, but we want to think a little bit about that rebalancing. I was, as you were saying that, I, okay, I created a scenario in my brain. So whether this has happened or not, let's, let's play along. Okay. You, uh, you're a professor at Columbia, right? Um, I, Columbia, amazing school. I imagine you sitting, I don't know, in the courtyard and up strolls next to you a guy in like a, a tweed overcoat and some glasses, gray disheveled hair. And he happens to be the uh, economics professor there. Right. And he says, you know what, Catherine, I, I heard your 
episode or your interview on Smart People Podcast. And um, look, this is supply and demand. This is economics. If the middleman starts taking too much and the producers aren't making a profit, they will stop. Therefore, the middlemen will not have a job. It's a symbiotic relationship. So like they might take a little bit more, but supply and demand economics will dictate that the system doesn't break. The producer gets enough money to make a profit. The middleman gets enough money to make a profit. And in the end, the consumer benefits because they get cheaper goods sourced globally faster. Yeah. So I'm friends with a lot of economists, a lot of the finance professors. I spent a lot of time over there. And I think they would actually probably not use that depiction these days. And I'll give you at least three different reasons. To I mean, I don't, you should I think don't, about I don't, it <laughs> No, it's huge. But it's okay. Yeah. So one is that was in a kind of a rational choice model is that as consumers, we're making rational choices that really do reflect our long-term best interest. And one of the things that we have learned through behavioral economics is there's actually an incredible variety of ways that we actually are consistently making decisions that are not consistent with our own long-term best interests. And the truth is middlemen have become better and better over time at understanding and exploiting those biases. So they know how to feed into all of our tendencies uh, in ways that actually have us making decisions that might seem like what we want, but but that are not long-term healthy, which again, doesn't mean we need a paternalistic regulatory regime, but we do need to take a step back and say like, look, I'm making all these decisions, but am I really happier as a result of it? Is it really making me and my family better off? Is it feeding my long-term values? And oftentimes there's a huge disparity because they've become so good. The other is another thing economists have been really good at is really they're the source of the understanding public choice theory. And effectively, public choice theory is if we want to understand the actual laws and regulations that are in place, we don't want to assume that all policymakers are just public minded. We have to be more honest about the constituencies that have influence over those policymakers. And part of what we've seen is, again, intermediaries are incredibly, incredibly effective lobbyists. And one, they give a lot of money. You know, so if you look at the different areas where we have these systems that have been entrenched and you can look in kind of, yeah, real estate agents, we still, we pay them a lot more than other countries do. And we've had a lot of state laws that actually protect a really high fee regime. We've had federal laws that have protected people, you know, from banks from kind of getting in competition. Amazon right now is an incredible effective lobbying arm. And the book has, my book is direct, uh, indirect. It goes through example after example of the way middlemen originally come forward because they are providing very real value. But then over time, all of the advantages that make them so useful also allow them to contort both con- like cons- like individual decision making, uh, but also the subsequent evolution of policy in ways that actually can preclude the disruptive innovations we need. And third, like that's where I'd say is the really economists oftentimes recognize that there are significant frictions to disruption. <laughs> Um, and so the a healthy system, you are going to get that disruption. You're going to get that change that, I, you know, innovations are going to come in and really result in meaningful shifts of power. But there's a lot of areas where we're actually seeing that we're not getting that. And, and part of what we're starting to reexamine in things like merger policy and, and other areas are how not only can middlemen shape the subsequent evolution of policy, but they're using their expertise and their understanding of how the market's going to evolve to actually buy up potential threats to competition. So, you know, Amazon goes in, they buy diapers.com, they buy Zappos, they buy the the companies that are in slightly different spaces, but that one day could be meaningful competitors. And so that over time, again, gives them such power that can be hard to opt out. So it's not saying we shouldn't like stop everything that they're doing, but we have to pay a lot of attention to the particular ways that they're influencing individual decision-making, policy-making, and the capacity of the market to actually have those disruptive forces operate the way the the model suggests that they need to, to have a healthy capitalist system. Yeah. First of all, thank you for that. Excellent, really excellent um, explanation of that because, you know, I personally have never fully subscribed to that perfect economic model because I just don't see how you could post, I don't know, industrial era. But um, but the description of that and then also how it's almost this Trojan horse of middlemen add value 
until they become too powerful and then they subtract value for their own gain. And, and you know, that impact being leading to an even less uh, capitalistic society and more of like a, I don't know, monopolistic type environment, which we're seeing with like Amazon and Walmart and probably Target being, I don't know, 80 percent of purchases or something like that. That was a complete guess, but I'd imagine. (laughs) This week's episode is brought to you by the Lifestyle Intelligence LQ app. Human intelligence is wonderfully complex. Historically, researchers have relied on IQ tests to measure what people know and how quickly they can solve problems. These tests alone do not account for the full range of people's thinking abilities. They don't predict success in school, life, or business. Then the concept of emotional intelligence came to be as a way to describe another set of thinking skills, the ability to recognize and regulate emotion and to use social awareness in problem solving. Recently, a new measured intelligence has emerged, coined lifestyle intelligence. Lifestyle intelligence is a learned pathway toward balanced, healthy living. Through three-minute daily focus audio tracks delivered five days a week, each track supports steady progress towards balanced, healthy living. Successful living is built on rhythmic consistency, and there is nothing more important than a solid backbeat. The LQ app gives listeners the ability to maximize their quality of life by reprogramming personal habits, enhancing sensory awareness, and building a transformative body of knowledge around the conversations we have with ourselves. LQ is available for iPhone users to download from the Apple App Store. Go to lqapp.co slash smart and click get the app for a one-month free trial to all new users. That's lqapp.co slash smart and click get the app. And now back to the episode. They're a very, very significant part. I mean, yeah. part of what's hopeful, though, as I should say, is there is kind of an alternative ecosystem. It just needs some support, right? So we see Shopify playing a real role, helping small businesses, small creators set up an online site. We have eBay. We have Etsy. We have these areas that small players can come in. But then you have the challenge of fulfillment. So, I mean, then there's a the question of, like, is there more that we can do to really help the post office to, to really have it not only be profitable, which is may, may not be the right goal, I would say, but instead be a mechanism through which we can help to bottom up support for small businesses and small creators, just make it so when people want to opt out, they really have the ability to do so. And do you think that we need to rely on the government to help us with that system? Do you think that it will naturally come about the way Shopify did from a supply and demand? You know, people saying, I want more local or, you know, artisanal or whatever you want to call it, independent uh, creator goods and services. I mean, what, how do we get away from it when it is so easy just to click that Amazon button? So I would say it's all of the above. One, uh, I think government does have a a really important role to play, not in terms of dictating what structures look like, but trying to maintain an environment where there's healthy competition and where there's healthy choice. And then understanding kind of these intermediation designs to figure out, well, where are the the ways the government can strategically come in and and not completely level the playing field because that's never going to happen. But, but if Amazon and Walmart, you know, both own their own trucks and these really state of the art warehouses, well, right now the postal service is saying, you know, it used to be we wanted three days for a first class package to be on time. Now in a lot of situations, we're going to allow it to be four days or five days. You know, like that makes sense if they're trying to like protect their bottom line, but it makes it that much harder for small businesses to say, look, we can really be, be competitive. So it's, it's trying to think about kind of the po- role of policymaking, both top-down competition policy, but also bottom-up infrastructure support. How can we help make sure people have choice? So one is the policymakers. Two, it is innovation. You know, we are seeing a lot of really healthy innovation with platforms, with companies like Shopify. Um, but sometimes, like, again, you need to create an environment where that innovation can flourish. And be honest about the way incumbents can use their power to quash uh, innovations that really could benefit people. And third, there is a, a burden on each of us individually. And again, neither none of us are going to solve this. It's not trying to tell anybody you shouldn't stop at Amazon. I mean, the reality is I do. Most working parents I know do. Um, but it's occasionally choosing to opt out of that system. 
And then it's like learning who you are, learning where that might make sense for you and, and understanding how an opting out and once in a while making the extra effort and it is extra effort to yeah. go all the way to the source and to like really connect with a creator, connect with a farmer. It just provides this resonance, like this reminder that all the food we're eating, all the clothes we're wearing, all of the other goods in our life, there's people in their places that are affected by that production process that we are systematically blinding to. So it's kind of reawakening uh, those parts of ourselves that have been lulled to sleep. And I think I'd say effectively dulled in the current environment. I hope that's in your book, reawakening the parts <laughs> that have been lulled. I mean, that hits the nail on the head. I actually had a conversation with my brother the other day. His his daughter, my niece, is um, she's almost ten, and um, they went to an antique store. And one of her favorite things is a an old rotary phone, and like that's what she wants. And we got into this whole discussion about I think that younger generations are going to start swinging the pendulum back, right? So uh, as a really old millennial, you know, I got to see both. And really, I think we latched on to technology because of how helpful and how aspirational it is. Gen Z, you see it, they grow up in it. They have uh, obviously a lot of social, um, they, they, you know, they care about a lot of social issues, but also very tech in it, but like once you get to this younger Gen Z or perhaps maybe the next, I think we have started to see the downside. And I think the trends are going to go back to not being lulled to sleep. I think we're seeing it in food, in the amount of people that want to just have a little garden. When you grow your own produce and you recognize how freaking impossible it is to get a strawberry that big, like when you do, you just value it differently. So I do, I, that's what I see. I'm curious on your take on if you think people inherently want to start having more transparency in this process. Yeah. And that is actually one of the things that direct really explores as a book is that the current ecosystem that we have really grew out of this assumption that all consumers care about is the lowest price possible, you know, for a given quality of good and all investors care about is maximizing risk adjusted returns. And then suddenly, as you said, there's so many people who are coming to the table and saying, look, the economy feels broken. Like I look at the world, I look at the values I have, there's a massive mismatch and I need to figure out ways to express that and be kind of part of, part of the change that I want to see. And so part of what you do is, first of all, start to appreciate the way that right now, you know, when you eat a chocolate bar, you're supporting exploitation and child labor, which is like heartbreaking, you know, for me to realize. But then we are seeing the growth of this direct movement. So, I mean, the, what, what I really try to depict is that we are at a pivot point. Um, there's some really powerful players. They provide incredible ease, incredible convenience. So there's a lot of reasons to think we're just going to kind of keep tilting back to the dominant system. You know, we're facing inflationary pressures. We're tired. We're exhausted. So what seems easiest and what seems shortest, you know, cheapest can be really tempting. But then there is this counter movement that's a very powerful counter movement that, that we see taking place in so many different ways, uh, where people are making much more thoughtful choices, um, and trying to go direct, trying to seek out shorter, more accountable, more sustainable chains. So they really understand impact. Um, and so I think part of the question is like, which of these is going to win out? Um, and then there's like kind of this in between great. And again, it's not one or the other. Sure. It's about trying to make sure that there's an environment where there can be both, you know, where one does not squish the other. And part of it also is just being honest that when you have chains that were maximized in the way that the current ones have been maximized, you can't come in and just add a bunch of ESG labels for investments. You can't come in and just like add fair trade and, and organic, but those things are really helpful. But when you look at a lot of the research, the effects are mixed. Uh, in part because it's hard to get really meaningful accountability and sustainability uh, when all you're relying on is a rule-based system that can be gamed and you don't actually have direct access to understand uh, the impact. And so really thinking through, well, if we want there to be more accountability in how we invest and how we consume, we have to know more. And that requires supply chains to look different than they do right now. You know, we've 
I think in the in the first 30 minutes here, we have told a, a very topical uh, story from start to finish. And, and, and that's I like to do that because I always say, you know, there's there's more information in the book. But then I like to use this this last portion here to get more granular in specific areas. One that really stuck out to me and I wrote it down is you said, you know, we might be buying off Amazon and we might have this accessibility and this ease and the, and the lower cost, but is it actually making our lives better? Is it making us happier? Something I think of often is how do we, you know, by most accounts, continue to live better and better lives, especially in the Western uh, world, yet have declining happiness rates. And uh, consumerism consumption is so fascinating to me. I think about this constantly. I was at the store the other day looking at bottled water, and I'm going, how, how can you sell this many different types of bottled water? Um, And then it hit me like, when you increase money supply or opportunity or whatever it is, access, you then need to use it to sell more things. And so, you know, we've just created, I mean, everybody knows this about marketing, but we've created needs where there are none that have led to a feeling of, I don't have enough. And it's like, so backwards to me. So I know that's not directly what you write about, but it is to an extent because that's what middlemen do. How do you think about that? It's very related, I think, to the core themes indirect, because that is the incentives of the middlemen that we're constantly engaging with. You know, every single time you log on to any online store, you're seeing this like customized environment to make you want stuff. And as a practical matter, when you just check the news or you check your social media, you're also getting all of these bombardments that are suggesting by it's like what we have in our lives uh, that's going to make us happier because that's how other people are going to make their money. And, and so going back to your point about happiness, I mean, one of the areas of research that I really got into was actually in the loneliness epidemic. And I'd heard vague things about it, but when you dig into the research, it does look like we really, even before the pandemic, were facing a loneliness epidemic that, that was almost on par with the obesity epidemic in terms of the public health consequences. And so you're seeing meaningfully higher rates of both morbidity and mortality uh, because people just feel so isolated. And so you're right, like the middlemen make it so convenient. We can order, we don't actually have to engage with anybody. We can just like stare at a screen and something shows up at us. Well, traditionally these were moments of actually a possible connection. And going back to your point earlier, some people are rediscovering connection in those areas. You know, like part of going direct to a maker is yes, that requires a little more effort, but then you're oftentimes not just getting good. It's a possibility to help cultivate that sense of connection, to cultivate that community that actually has a lot of repercussions. It can change how you feel about the good and how the, the fabric of your day-to-day life is experienced. So part of what the book does is kind of draw out the two different extremes. You know, it's not about one extreme or the other. It's about rebalancing. But it's showing like, look, we live in this hyper intermediated world where we're surrounded by these actors who, yeah, see consumption as what they want to drive us to do. And we're going to consume some and some consumption is like, you know, perfectly fine. But there's actually this whole different ecosystem that could arise when you have the opportunity to connect where suddenly it is about kind of bringing a good, but there's a story behind it, there's a person behind it. And when it happens over and over time, you can actually have relationships and community building that happens. And so once we understand these two different extremes, like then we can start to figure out, like how do we rebalance in between these two? Yeah, rebalance is such a good word there. You know, I wanna I wanna take some time to really give some examples of this middleman economy. Um, the easiest is the food system. And I don't want to do that only because, and I'm telling this to the listeners, uh, there's a really, really great explanation of this already on smart people podcast. So go to episode 387 with John McConaughey. Instead, I want to talk about two specific ones you mentioned that drive me nuts. The first, and you said it sparked with the financial collapse. Now I worked in commercial real estate when that went down, I was lending 
Okay, I was making the loans on these large buildings that were then being put together in tranches and sold off and collateralized and eventually crashed the market. I was literally like, I don't know if you want to call it ground zero, but like first floor. It was um, all your fault. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I was way too junior for that. So I'm, um, it's okay for me to say it. But I want to give you an example. I remember we would look at a loan, uh, say it's for $50 million. And we'd say, man, like, we think we should do this at a 4% rate. But I know that every other lender is going to do it at three and a half. So we got to come close at 3.6 and da, 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 right? And so there's this, um, look, if we want to stay in business, we have to compete, even though we know the fundamentals aren't exactly correct. And the way that was happening is what you were talking about, which was we were putting them into these collateralized debt obligations. And we were saying we we're de-risking it to an extent. Um which led to fragility and led to the crash. What I don't know enough about, and I, I really don't think many people do, um, is how that is actually part of the middleman economy. So walk us through in as plain a language as possible how the 2008 financial collapse was essentially caused by this middleman economy. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it was one contributor. There were a lot of things that went into the 2008 financial crisis, but I think the two defining characteristics of the middleman economy, which is overly powerful middlemen and overly long and complex supply chains feeding off each other, characterize a lot of what we saw in finance in the aughts in ways that contributed to the crisis. So if you think about it traditionally, banks in the United States, we had rules that really limited their growth. So we had a community bank-based system. There were benefits. There were also some meaningful drawbacks. But it meant it was a relationship-based system. And when that bank was making a loan, first of all, sometimes there wasn't perfect competition, for better or for worse, um, and, but there's some benefits to not having complete competition uh, in finance. But ultimately, they knew they were going to hold on to that loan for the life of it. So they had to be thinking about their long-term viability because they knew that it was going to be sitting on their balance sheet. Similarly, if you had problems... You know, because like you lost your job or housing prices went down, like you could go to that bank and renegotiate. And that was helpful for you, but it was also helpful for the bank and it was helpful for foreclosures. And so what we see is that actually when you have a shock to housing prices, renegotiating and negotiating a lower principal price can actually increase the value, the expected cash flows, because it means people are more likely to pay it off than to walk away with a you know house that ends up in foreclosure that that really can't be sold for all that much. So you shift and then you say, look, we have this great innovation called securitization. And you know, some securitization is actually okay. It's saying, we don't want all this interest rate risk sitting with banks. There's pension funds and these other institutional investors who are actually better suited to hold some of those risks. And so what we can do is take all these loans and put them into this new bundle and then parse up the cash flow, the principal, the interest payments to different tranches. So some are really protected, some are taking on more risk, but they're getting a higher interest rate. But then we started to get more complicated. So we're like, all right, well, let's take some of those mortgage-backed securities and package those into like the collateralized debt obligations. So we started getting layers upon layers, right? Uh, and then that requires all these other actors to come into play. So instead of having a bank collect all your payments and foreclose, it's like a servicer who doesn't have imperfect you know, information or incentives. So all these other actors. And you just suddenly have this much, much more complex system. And so part of what was so striking, going back to 07 and 08, two things. One, um, the actual size of the losses on mortgages weren't actually that significant. I mean, they were significant, but they were minor relative to the magnitude of the ultimate crisis. And a lot of those mortgage-backed securities actually rebounded in value after the crisis. And one of the core challenges is that these really complex securitization chains made it so once things went wrong no, and nobody trusted the credit ratings that they'd been relying on, they couldn't actually get the underlying information they needed to, or at least not in a cost-effective way, to understand what these assets were worth. So everybody pulled back in unison. And it's that simultaneous pulling back of, I don't know, and therefore I don't trust, and I'm not going to buy, that significantly magnified this dysfunction that followed. 
And it made it hard for policymakers too. So you can go back to the FOMC minutes, the Federal Open Market Committee. And I mean, first of all, the crisis started in August 2007. So there were 13 months between when both the ECB and the Fed recognized like there's something really wrong going on here and when Lehman failed. And you go to those early statements and you have like Fed governor like Randy Krosner, who's now, you know, back in Chicago saying, you know, like back in the battle days, like all of the risks were on banks and it was bad, but we at least knew what the risks were. He's like, with securitization and originate to distribute, we no longer know where the risks are. And that was a key challenge is that they couldn't come in and say, look, here's where the problems are. And we're going to selectively recapitalize or address the kind of the problems of the system because neither the private actors involved nor the policymakers understood how the risks were allocated. And so that unknown significantly exacerbated the dysfunction. It caused the Fed to be slow coming in. And then finally, they had to go in in this massive big way, just plugging up every single hole, which led to all of the pop up backlash that we saw because they didn't have kind of the granular information to figure out how to go in in a more targeted way. And so it wasn't just that, but it played a very, very significant role, I would say, on both sides. And so... And then, as I say, I forgot. And then you also have the fact that just banks really had strategically used their influence during that time. So when states tried to come in, because states saw this happening, and states actually adopted a bunch of new loans to, or new rules to protect against predatory lending... And the banks went to the OCC and the OTS, which are the two big bank regulators, and said, you need to preempt all of these state laws that actually would have protected consumers, but also would have reduced the number of bad loans that subsequently got securitized. Like, And they they were bought in by the banks because the banks said, look, they are being naive. Here's reasons to do it. So it was partly bad regulation and an overly complex system. Right. But remember, you know, regulation is the antithesis of markets, which will save us from all of this fragility. Right. That that was the argument that really was. Um, I mean, we've seen it fail time and time again. And like you said, hopefully we recognize against it in that example. Would you say that the pre middleman economy was I go to the bank, they give me money. I have a loan. I know they're holding it. They know I'm paying it. And like, it's that simple. And so they can say, OK, we've got we've got this many people who potentially might default and we can cover it, et cetera. And then what happens in the middleman economy is they try to share that risk, which is not a bad thing with more people. But the more people they share it and the more ways they combine it, it starts to get murky. It starts to get uh, razor thin. And that's where the fragility comes from. Is that kind of a very simplification of it? Yeah, so I think that is a key part of it. And again, I think first level securitization vehicles that are relatively plain vanilla still make a lot of sense. You're re you're you know you're reallocating risk in ways that make sense. But what you saw over time, going back to your short timerism point, are the effort to eke out ever more and ever more and ever more. And for the originators, you know, you back in your commercial underwriting yeah. days, you know, like you weren't going to ultimately be bearing the risks. Exactly. And so like it, that and that created a, a significant change in how you were going about trying to make that determination. It also meant, when, let's say that borrower, like, you know, we saw all of these houses that were suddenly underwater. Banks actually did a pretty good job renegotiating when the loans were on their balance sheet because it was better for them and it was better for everybody else because it reduced foreclosures, which actually really depressed housing values in a neighborhood. But the securitization structure, well, you suddenly have this servicer, which is the person that you actually interact with. And they sold um, the servicing. And they sold the servicing. But the challenge there is depending on how they renegotiated, like the AAA might be affected differently than the triple B. And so suddenly they don't want to negotiate principal, even if it would increase the total cash flows, because you're affecting different tranches differently. And like they're just afraid they're going to get sued. And so you really had a lot of like short term benefits, but long term costs that weren't weighed right. But the good yeah. news is like the financial system isn't perfect today, but it's a heck of a lot more resilient. We created yes. structures that created increased transparency, that reduced the incentive problems, that built up kind of resilience within institutions. And so I think part of what the book's trying to show is, is now we need to think about how to do that for the real economy. It's like, how do we actually build in the accountability and the resilience, which again, is not scrapping the entire system, but rebalancing it 
so it better serves our needs. When you say the real economy there, I, I, I'm very curious on, you know, in your book, what uh, what are you trying to kind of tackle in that, right? Because if it's if the financial system isn't the real economy, which I'm not saying that's what you said, but, um, you know, just get a sense of like, what is the scope we're talking about here? Or are we looking at individual verticals when we're talking about middleman economy? Um, so yeah, oftentimes I think you want to tackle the problem vertical by vertical. I mean, so part of what the book tries to show or what, part of what I explore in the growth of the middleman economy is that there's incredible similarities in what has happened into sector after sector, but there's also some meaningful differences, right? So direct can be a great thing when you're talking about food and other creative goods. It can be a good thing for somebody like loaning money to a friend, perhaps, but, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending really didn't work well. And I'd say it didn't work well and for foreseeable reasons because you're not going to get those, like, warm, touchy feelings. There's values to diversification and there's values to a little bit more expert screening. So it's, you know, it's like let's figure out um, kind of like what is – like so what is actually how we start to address these challenges and how we – what types of equilibria might be optimal – are going to vary. They're going to vary by technology, as it so it's going to change, and it's going to vary by sector. So part of what we want to do is understand these broad patterns. So we understand how the overall economy is working, you know, how it affects us individually. But then I think when we think about, well, how do we actually bring about more sustainability and accountability and resilience, you really need to understand, well, what are the rules that intermediary is playing here? Because like naive efforts at disruption and direct you know, really turn out badly. And once you understand the value they're creating, you can try to figure out, well, are they capturing more than they should? Are they exercising outsized influence? Uh, where is there a need or is there a need for some rebalancing? And what does that look like? As you were talking about that, and I'm thinking different verticals, and I'm thinking about what you were talking about. In some aspects, it makes sense to be more direct. In some, we need it. I just can't help it. Um, I went to a coffee shop the other day and uh, I'm not going to name the coffee shop, but it's the one that we all go to. And uh, there was a sign on the door that said, we are out of ground coffee. Our uh, main coffee machine, whatever the hell, I don't know, doesn't work. The only milk option we have is skim milk. And I was furious because I know, and this, this is a, this is a, you know, an example of many businesses. If you look in 2021, I bet their, their, uh, profit margin was higher than ever before. Right. I bet you executive pay was higher than ever before. And that's because of the, uh, streamlining nature, the cutting costs at all areas so that in a perfect environment, it worked. But then when that environment shifts at all, ultimately the consumer who has been, you know, uh, m revolving their life around, to, to an extent, your service or good shows up. You're just like, sorry, you're shit out of luck, right? Our bad. We'll get it back tomorrow. But because they're also the only coffee shop on every corner, everywhere, you don't have the options. And this is... Ultimately, as we get to the end of the interview, is the thing that angers me most about this idea of the middleman economy. Um, that's how I see fragility. How do you define it? And how does this example of going to a shop that has told me they have 15 different milk choices now only has one, even though we're in 2022 with more technology than ever before, I feel like we're evolving backwards. Yeah. And so I think actually the point that you made that was key is the fact that you didn't feel like there was another place to go, right? If you went to another shop, it was going to be owned by the exact same owner. And so a lot of it is like, how do we make sure, and be honest, it's going to require at times like investments, both public and private, that we continue to have a variety of healthy different options. And when it comes to kind of the middleman economy in particular, recognizing like the distinct role they play makes it far too easy for them to exercise kind of outsized power that contorts the ability to have the healthy forces that are actually kind of like feeding resilience and feeding community work the way that they're supposed to. 
I mean, and again, it's not that all middlemen are bad. I, I mean, so I, I close the book with these five different principles. I talk about like, here's how policy, you know, these five ideas that can be used by policymakers, they can be used by entrepreneurs, but they can also be used by individuals. And one of them is just like, know how, like, I think follow the fees, which really just means like, know how the middlemen in your life make their money, because that's also going to tell you like, who to trust how much to trust them. Uh, and, and part of the challenge, going back to your behavioral point earlier, is oftentimes what's short-term optimal for you isn't in your long-term best interest, but that's what's going to seem like the best thing in the short run. Um, you know, like, uh, so like, you know, I used to be a financial advisor, actually, before I went to law school, you know, or a stockbroker. And part of the challenge there is you can either pay a big price up front um, and then really get investments that suit you, or you can seem to get all these services for free, and then you have a broker that's going to put you in a bunch of investments that spin off a bunch of fees for that broker. And that latter model is more expensive to you in the long run, but it feels free. And then the way that connects to kind of your point about the, the local chain is part of what you see is a lot of like local retailers, they really depend actually on on long-term relationships with customers in their area, right? Like I love our local bookstore and our local wine store. They know me, they're a relationship institution. So part of it is kind of like really understanding kind of the incentives and the business model of all the different middlemen that you interact with. And you can start to figure out like which ones do you trust, which ones do you trust less. And so individually you can start just to make the decisions that work better for you. But then as a policy matter, it's trying to understand like where have we gotten to such a level of concentration that that we don't have that that healthy degree of choice and optionality. That's a really good point. I think ending it on what we can do as individuals is is really important. And the discussion of look, it might take a little more effort um, to to do these things. But then like in my case, right, it, it might take more effort to drive a little further and go to the local coffee shop. But if I don't do that, I can't complain when the large chain who uses all their profit to create more accessibility, I can't complain when they no longer serve me. So be aware of those trade-offs, kind of that short-termism you were talking about. That's a really interesting point for me. You know, because I think we all go shop local or support the little guy or all this. We, we, we want to feel it, but especially today, we will often more easily sacrifice, um, you know, accessibility and ease of use and, and sometimes cost for the sustainability portion. Yeah, and I think, I think it's often true. And part of the point of the book is actually... It can seem like that's the easiest, best thing for you to do, but you yourself might be happier at times if you make a little effort once in a while, but it's also not just on you. And so it's it's helping to understand these big structures so each of us individually can make better decisions, but we also know kind of what are the types of policies we need to create a, an economy that really kind of shifts power, you know, away from the middlemen and really back into the hands of the individuals who are the creators, who are the consumers, who are the who should be the the backbone of a healthy economy and society. I love it. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. The book is Direct the Rise of the Middleman Economy and the Power of Going to the Source. Um, look, I'll say this in the intro, but my goal with this episode was to spark interest and awareness in an area that I don't think there is as much. And I'm speaking for myself until I heard of this just a few months ago, I never really considered what happens between the beginning and the end outside of potentially food supply, because that's what I'm passionate about. But when you look at other areas, so many impacts. So if you're listening and this does spark your curiosity, the book really goes into detail on what it is, different, um, you know, different areas that are affected by it and what we can do about it. Again, the book is Direct, The Rise of the Middleman Economy and the Power of Going to the Source. Catherine, where else are you? Are you out there tweeting, writing? What's up next for you? Where can we find you? Yeah, so I have a website, katherinejudge.com, K-T-H-R-Y-N, judge.com, uh, Twitter, Prof Kate Judge. Uh, so reach out. I would love to hear from you. I really love the stories that people have of their own challenges, but also, you know, the opportunities when they've actually gone direct and, and found something good from it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been joy. 
This week's guest was Catherine Judge. It was hosted, as always, by Chris Stemp and edited by yours truly, John Rojas. Catherine's book, Direct, The Rise of the Middleman Economy and the Power of Going to the Source, is available now wherever books are sold. If you'd like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. And of course, if you want to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter. All right, that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got a lot of great interviews coming up and we'll see you all next episode.